This video is all about confidence intervals. We'll start out by saying, let's suppose that we conducted a survey, and it was a yes-no question survey, and we got a sample proportion. How good an estimate is that sample proportion for the population proportion? So in other words, if I know the sample proportion, how far low and how far high do I go so I can say I'm confident that the population proportion is within this interval? Then we'll do the same idea for the population mean. So if we conduct a study at which it is quantitative and we have a sample mean, then that's an estimate for the population mean. And the big question is, how good an estimate is it? How far off might we be up or down? And we'll start out just quickly by talking about when you happen to know the population standard deviation. And then we'll move on to when you really don't know the population standard deviation, which in the real world is pretty much always the case. And the last thing which we'll do for each of these is look at sample size. So a very important piece of planning a study is deciding how many people you must survey or how much data you must collect in order to have a reliable estimate for the population. And we'll have some formulas that show us to how to find the sample size needed to get a reliable estimate. So let's start out by talking about some terminology. Some of this you've seen before, some will be new. So let's start out with point estimate. So the point estimate is the best estimate for the population parameter using the sample data. So if you're going to conduct a study, that's a yes, no question, and you want to get an estimate for the population proportion, our best estimate, will be the sample proportion. So the point estimate for the population proportion is the sample proportion. We could say something similar about the means and other things. Another key piece of vocabulary, which happened in the prior chapter, was a standard error. And that was the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And it gives an idea of how close your point estimate is likely to be from the population parameter. Then we'll look into the margin of error. The margin of error is the maximum likely difference between the observed statistic and the population parameter. So suppose that you surveyed a bunch of people and found out that 58% of them approve of the way the president is handling the, his job or her job. So the question might be is, well, how good an estimate is that 58%? And you say, well, I might be off by 5%. That would be the margin of error. Then we'll talk about the confidence level. And the confidence level is very important in this chapter. And that is the probability, we'll often write one minus alpha, that the confidence interval will contain the population mean. So I kept saying, how likely is it gonna be that you're within that margin of error? Kind of that how likely has a lot to do with this confidence level, because it's a probability, which is a likelihood. And the final little piece of vocabulary is a critical value. And that is the value of Z, such that the area of the normal curve between negative z and z is 1 minus alpha. And we'll kind of look at that in a picture in a bit. So let's talk about confidence intervals. So a 1 minus alpha confidence interval, the kind of the standard, will be a 95% confidence interval. For the population parameter, for this week it'll be for the population mean or the population proportion is an interval centered about the sample statistic, that'd be like the sample mean or the sample proportion, with width equal to twice the margin of error. 
The width is twice the margin of error because if you go left by the margin of error and you go right by the margin of error, then from far left to far right is two margin of errors. So that's why the width is twice the margin of error. And in particular, if many samples are taken from a population with the same sample size, then the proportion of the constructed confidence intervals that will contain the population parameter is this one minus alpha. So often 95%, sometimes 90% or 99%, whatever you need in order to feel adequately confident. So the idea is, let's say you are in the business of looking at studies and then writing about them. And that might be that you're publishing a, you know, a news article, okay? And you're in the business of publishing news articles based on research, okay? So if that's the case, you might want to say, well, in those news articles, sometimes they're not going to be right because they use a sample. But most of the time, they better be right. And what you feel comfortable with that probability of being right that's going to be the confidence level, which is this one minus alpha. So here's an example. A Gallup survey of 935 registered voters resulted in 312 answering yes to do most members of Congress deserve re-election? Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the population proportion of all registered voters who think that most members of Congress deserve re-election. So we're going to use all that stuff that we had in the last few chapters to come up with this interval. Let's start out by looking at all these numbers and writing down what they are. So we had 935 registered voters. That's the sample size. So I write N equals 935. 312 answered yes. So my P hat, which is a sample proportion of yes answers, will be the 312 yes answers over the 935 total people surveyed. And I popped that in a calculator and I got about 0.33. One thing that we learned from before was that in order to use a normal distribution, we need to make sure that NP and NQ were greater than 5. But that's pretty obvious because 0.33 is basically a third, and a third of 935, that would be NP, is much bigger than 5. And 1 minus that, or Q, is 2 thirds, and around 2 thirds of 935 is also much bigger than 5. So there's no problem using the central limit theorem and saying that we have a normal distribution. So I've written down the standard normal distribution, which means that the mean is zero, standard deviation is one. And if I want a 95% confidence interval, 0.95, then I can shade in this area where zero is at the center and I have 0.95 as a total area. And using the normal distribution calculator, I was able to find negative 1.96 to 1.96 to make that work. We also remember from the empirical rule that between negative 2 and 2, you get 95% of the data. Okay, more precisely, negative 1.96 to 1.96, to two decimal places of accuracy. So that's very important. Also some, from the central limit theorem, we had that mu sub p hat was approximately equal to p hat, and that was 0.33. The central limit theorem also gave us that sigma sub p hat was equal to the square root of pq over n, and I'm going to approximate p and q by p hat and q hat. So the square root of p hat q hat over n is the square root of 0.33 times 1 minus that, which is 0.67, divided by n, which was 935. 
and I popped that in my calculator, and I got that that was about equal to 0 0.015. So now we have the sampling distribution. We can also figure out z using a z-score. So z is equal to, remember, x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And if I solve for x by multiplying by the standard deviation and then adding our mean, I get x is equal to mu sub p hat plus z times sigma sub p hat. And that is going to give us at least the right bound of the confidence interval. Okay, now if you consider z being 1.96, that's the right bound. But if z is negative 1.96, that's going to give you the left bound. So again, mu sub p hat was p hat, okay, at least approximately equal to it. So we can write down that our confidence interval is equal to our p hat, that's our best estimate, and then our margin of error is going to be the rest. So we're going to go plus or minus the left-hand side and the right-hand side. This z sub 1 minus alpha and that in this particular case is 1.96 times our standard deviation, square root of p hat q hat over n, which is about 0 0.015. So that's our confidence interval, and that's the calculation to find the confidence interval. So I could plug this in. I can find the margin of error first. That's the plus or minus the z, which is 1.96, times our sigma, which is 0 0.015. And I get basically plus or minus 0 0.03. So now I just plug in. I have my p hat is 0.33. If I subtract 0 0.03, I get 0 0.30. And if I add the 0 0.03, I get 0.36. And that gives us our confidence interval from 0.3 to 0.36. And now I can write down my conclusion. And I can say with 95% confidence between 30%, that's the 0.3, and 36%, that's the 0.36, of all registered voters in the United States, not just our sample, but now we're talking about the entire population of the United States who are registered voters, think that most members of Congress deserve re-election. So that's the conclusion for a confidence interval. That's the main point of what we get. Now, what does it mean to be 95% confident? So here's what it means. It has to do with kind of like a probability of getting it right. And when you're talking about a probability of getting it right, you're saying of all the different possibilities, 95% of the time I'll get it right, and 5% I won't get it right. So in words, if we took many, many polls, each with sample size 935, because that was our sample size we used, then each of these polls would result in a different confidence interval. Okay, in particular, here we got a confidence interval between 0.3 and 0.36. If we asked a different 935 people, then we'll get different data and we'll get a different confidence interval. But the important thing is 95% of these confidence intervals will contain the true population proportion of all registered voters, in this case, who think that most members of Congress deserve re-election. And that's how we interpret this confidence level of 95%. It's not the conclusion. It's an interpretation of the confidence level. The conclusion is, starts with, we are 95% confident that between, etc. All right, let's do another example. So here's the example. A study was done to estimate the proportion of online college students who feel like they are enrolled in too many classes. Of the 150 students who were surveyed, 60 of them answered that they were. 
determine a 95% confidence interval. So as we'll always be doing, the first step is to look to see what kind of confidence interval we have. Okay, this is definitely a yes, no question. The question that you're gonna ask these students is, do you feel like you're enrolled in too many classes? And they're gonna say yes, or they're gonna say no. So in that case, we're gonna need our N, our P hat, and our confidence level. So let's get them. We have 150 students, so N is 150. 60 of them answered they were. I'm gonna call that X, X equals 60. We have a 95% confidence interval that we wanna find. So the CL for confidence level is 0 0.95. I could do this like I did the last example, but I'm gonna show you a much easier way. And as you're used to in this class by now, is the easier way is to use a calculator. So let's go ahead and pop this into a calculator. The calculator, and we're gonna scroll, and we're gonna look for a confidence interval, and we're looking for a proportion, because it was a yes, no question. So confidence interval for a proportion. And I click that, and then it asks us, what is N? And then N, was 150. It asks us what X was. X was 60. And it asks us for the confidence level. Confidence level was 95%.95. And I hit calculate. And there we got it. The lower bound was about 0.32. And the upper bound is about 0.4. Eight. So now let's go and write down our conclusion. So here's the conclusion. With 95% confidence between 32% and 48% of all online college students feel like they are enrolled in too many classes. Let's take a look at another example. So here it is. A biologist wants to estimate the proportion of Tahoe chicory squirrels that survive the winter. The biologist tagged 450 randomly selected squirrels in the fall. By spring, only 320 of them were still alive. Determine and interpret the 90% confidence interval for the population proportion. So notice this is also yes, no question. You look at that squirrel and you say, hey, did it live through the winter? And the answer is he lived or did not live. So that means we can, again, find a confidence interval for the population proportion. And what we can say is that we had 450 selected squirrels, that's N, N is 450, 320 of them, survive the winter, so X is equal to 320. We want a 90% confidence interval, so CL, confidence level, is equal to 0.9. Now let's jump into our calculator again. Okay, so here's the calculator, and we had that N was 450. We had the X was 320. Our confidence level this time is 0 0.90. And it hit calculate. That's how easy this is. Okay, to two decimal places, I'm looking at about 0.68 to 0.75. And now I can write down the conclusion. So I can conclude with 90% confidence between 68% and 75% of all chicory squirrels survive the winter. So hopefully you're seeing these are pretty similar. So let's take a look at our next big question. And that is, how many people do you need to survey? Or how many squirrels do you have to look at? Or whatever it is, how much data you do you have to collect? 
in order to have a confidence interval that's useful. So I am not going to get into the details of this, but here's the formulas. If you don't have a preliminary estimate for the population proportion, so if you have no clue what it's going to be, then here's a formula. N is equal to 0 0.25 times that Z quantity squared divided by the margin of error squared. On the other hand, if you happen to have an estimate for P, maybe you looked at it last year, now you're going to look at it this year and you're going to use last year as your estimate. Or maybe you did a small sample size, you'll use that small sample size for a good estimate for P to figure out how big a sample you really need. So then, remember, Q is 1 minus P. So then the sample size you need is PQ times the Z squared divided by the margin of error squared. The good news is that I created a calculator that, that really does this for you, but I did want to show you these formulas because, you know, there's stuff that comes up. And you'll notice, this is why the formulas are particularly important. If the margin of error is really small, then N is going to be bigger. Whereas if the margin of error is large, N will be smaller. Okay, that's the give and take with what you're okay with on margin of error. Okay, similarly, if Z is large, then the sample size that you need will also be large. Okay, notice, for example, if you want to go from a 95% confident, but you want to be a lot more confident than that, and you say, I want to be 99% confident instead, then the Z is going to get bigger, and the sample size you need to be more confident is also going to get bigger. So that's the give and take with this whole confidence level that we're looking at. It is an increased confidence level increases Z, which increases the necessary N. So let's look at an example. You want to perform a study to estimate the proportion of college students who receive financial aid. You want to construct a 95% confidence interval with a margin of error of no more than plus or minus 6%. How many people should you survey if you have no idea in advance what the proportion is? So again, 95% confidence level, margin of error of plus or minus 6%, and we don't have a preliminary estimate. So let's go to the calculator. So here's the calculator again. I'm going to scroll until I find sample size for a proportion. And I click on that. And we have no estimate for P, so I'm going to keep that clicked. The margin of error we want is 6%. 0.06. The confidence level was 0.95. I'm hit calculate N, and I get 267. So let's go back to the question. All right, so I need to survey 267 people so that I am going to have a margin of error of no more than plus or minus 6% given that I want a 95% confidence interval. Now here's the second question. Last year, the college found 30% of all college students receive financial aid. How many people should you survey this year? Okay, what's changed here is that we now have a preliminary estimate. I'm going to use this 30% to estimate the population proportion. It's not exactly the population proportion but it's going to work for me. And as long as it's a pretty close estimate, then we can use it. So let's go back to the calculator again. So here's the calculator. Now I can click on have estimate for P. And now it says, what is that estimate for P? That was 30% or 0.3. And I hit calculate N. And notice now it's 225. So I can go back 
and kind of compare and interpret. So notice that we need to survey 225 people if we did have the preliminary estimate, but we have to survey more if we don't. And that's most always going to be the case, is that having a preliminary estimate is going to save you some time so you don't have to survey quite as many if you have a goal of a certain margin of error. All right. Now that we've talked about proportions, let's move into the universe of means. So here's the deal. We want to estimate now not a proportion. We want to estimate a mean. And here I'm going to just kind of assume, which is awful because we never want to assume anything, that we happen to know the population standard deviation. Good luck knowing the population standard deviation. It's not going to happen, but just in case we did. Well, we know from the central limit theorem that mu sub x bar was equal to mu. Okay, and we're going to approximate mu by x bar. And we know that sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma over the square root of n. Again, that's from the central limit theorem. So now I can look at the confidence interval. Very similar to what we did with proportions is our best estimate was x bar. And then we go plus or minus. And then remember it was a z. Okay, that z that corresponded to the confidence level times the standard deviation for the sampling distribution. This time it's sigma over root n. So here is the confidence interval for means. And just a note, if n is large, then our margin of error, that's the z sub alpha over 2 sigma over root n, is going to be small because you're dividing by the square root of n. That's really important. Whereas if n is small, you might get a giant confidence interval, which means that you have no good information. So a bigger sample size is definitely better than a smaller sample size if your goal is to have a margin of error that's very small. So let's summarize all this. So again, the confidence interval is x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 times sigma over root n. So if sigma is smaller, that's good. We have a smaller margin of error. If n gets larger, then we also have a smaller margin of error, okay? which means, again, the width of the confidence interval will be smaller if you have a smaller margin of error. Okay? And note, this is important. Let's suppose you're looking at heights of people. And you, I said, I am 99% confident that the average person is between one inch tall and a thousand inches tall. That is totally useless because of course it is. So that's not a very interesting confidence interval or useful confidence interval because the width of the confidence interval is too wide. On the other hand, what if I said, I'm 5% confident that the average height of a person, of an adult, is between 5.71 and 5.72. That's also not very interesting at all, because being 5% confident means that I really don't know. I'm probably wrong. So there's this give and take. You can't have everything. But on the other hand, if you do a large sample size, you could be very confident and you can have a small margin of error. But of course, the problem with that is it takes a lot of work to get a large sample size. So again, if you decrease the confidence level, like 95% goes to 90%, then you're decreasing the critical value and thus the margin of error and the width of the confidence interval. So if you're OK being less confident, then you have a narrower width which sounds like it's more useful information, but it might be useful, except you're more likely to be wrong about it. So all kinds of gives and takes, and it's important to understand how these work. 
So here's an issue, a big issue. And that is these formulas that we used required that you know the population standard deviation. And you don't. Because remember that population standard deviation is computed using the population mean. And if you knew the population mean, you wouldn't need a confidence interval for the population mean. Because you'd be 100% confident it's exactly that number. So in the real world, you don't know the population mean. You don't know the population standard deviation. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the sample standard deviation to approximate the population standard deviation. And because we're approximating, there's going to be some error in our estimate. And a very long time ago, um, there was actually a guy who was studying beer, and he figured out that there was this error. He was the first to figure it out by doing confidence intervals for beer. And he came up with a distribution that is slightly different than the normal distribution. And he was also a professor, and he named the distribution after his students and called it the student's T distribution. Okay, this distribution turns out to have an additional parameter. We call that the degrees of freedom. And for the confidence intervals that we're working on this week, that's going to be n minus 1. Okay? Everything else is the same. All right? But now you're going to use S instead of sigma. S is going to be your estimate, your point estimate for the population standard deviation. In order to do this, you need to have either an approximately normal distribution to start with, which usually you have no idea about, or you need a sample size larger than 30 because we're using a central limit theorem. And those were the two pieces of information that you must have at least one of those in order to use a central limit theorem to say that you have a normal distribution for the sampling distribution. You must be larger than 30 when it comes to the sample size for quantitative data. Remember that for the yes-no question, it wasn't about 30, it was NP and NQ greater than 5. All right, so the bad news is the mathematics is really intense for this student's t-distribution. The good news is it's so intense that in elementary statistics, you don't have to worry about it. That was my job, and I made a calculator. And we'll use that for this example. So this is very important for where I live, and that is every year UC Davis measures the clarity of the lake. Um, the lake I live at is Lake Tahoe, and we want to keep our lake really clear instead of murky. So suppose that in 2021, the Davis researcher took 35 measurements and found the mean depth of clarity to be 21.7 meters. And the standard deviation was 1.6. Find a 95% confidence interval for the average depth of clarity of the lake. Okay, so notice again, we do not know the population standard deviation, and we pretty much never will. But we do know enough information. And here's the information we know. There were 35 measurements taken. That's a sample size, n equals 35. The mean depth of clarity for these 35 measurements was 21.7. That's x bar, or the sample mean, is 21.7. The sample standard deviation is 1.6, so s equals 1.6. We want a 95% confidence interval, so cl equals 0.95. So now we go to the calculator and come up with this confidence interval. Okay, so here's the calculator, and I'm going to scroll a little bit. And I want the confidence interval for a mean, and I have statistics, because I have an X bar and I have an S. So I click on number 9, 
and it asks, do you know the standard deviation or do you not know it? We don't know it, so I'm going to click on known. If we knew it, you click known. It asks for the sample size. The sample size was 35. It asks for X bar, the sample mean. And the sample mean was 21.7. It asked for the sample standard deviation, and that was 1.6. It asked for the confidence level, which was 0 0.95, 95% confidence. And I hit calculate. And there's our upper bound and our lower bound. The lower bound is 21.15, etc. And the upper bound is 22.15. 2496, etc. So now let's go and write down our interpretations. I can say with 95% confidence, it can be concluded that the population mean lake clarity is between 21.15 and 22.25 meters deep. Notice population mean. We're really talking about knowing the lake clarity for every moment throughout the year. We're not talking about this sample of 35. We're talking about the population mean. And confidence intervals always, always talk about the population, not the sample. We can also interpret the confidence level of 95%. And it's very similar to what we did with proportions. If UC Davis did this research many times, okay, which they do, by the way. And in fact, this little graph is a little plotting of all the different years. Every year they do the research. So they do it many times. Okay. Each was 35 measurements. Then each time they would come up with a different confidence interval. 95% of these confidence intervals will contain the population mean lake clarity. That is the interpretation of the confidence level of 95%. Let's look at another example. A restaurant owner wants to estimate the mean amount of money her customers spend at her restaurant. She looks at 50 randomly selected receipts and calculates the mean of these receipts to be $43.71 and the standard deviation to be $6.42. Determine and interpret the 90% confidence interval for the mean. So it's very similar. We have a sample size. We have a sample mean. We have a sample standard deviation and a confidence level. So here it is. N is 50. X bar, the sample mean, is 43.71. S, the sample standard deviation, is 6.42. And our CL, the confidence level, is 0.9. And now we can jump to the calculator and find the confidence interval. All right, so here's our confidence interval calculator again with statistics. We again don't know our sigma. We only know our S. We only know our sample standard deviation, not our population standard deviation. Our N this time was 50. The X bar was 43.71. The S, the sample standard deviation, was 6.42. And the confidence level this time was 0 0.90. Maybe, maybe she doesn't need to be quite as confident as you know, someone who's publishing a paper in science or something. Okay, this is business. And I hit calculate. And there we go. I think two decimals is probably good since we're talking money. So $42.19 and $45.23. Let's interpret.
So here's the conclusion. With 90% confidence, it can be concluded that the population mean, notice it's the population mean of all possible customers that would ever come to her restaurant. So the population mean amount of money her customers spend at her restaurant is between $42.19 and $45.23. So there's our confidence interval. Okay, and notice that might be good enough. You know, it's within a few dollars. That might be good enough for a restaurant owner. If it wasn't good enough, then what she would need to do is look at more receipts. Okay. And if she wasn't happy with a 90%, but she wanted a 95%, but she didn't want this margin of error to increase, more receipts. So increasing the sample size always gets more accurate information, better information in terms of predicting the population mean. Here is another example. A study was done to estimate the mean age when people buy their first car. The table below shows the resulting data from the study. Determine and interpret the 95% confidence interval for the mean, assuming a normal distribution. Okay, notice we need to assume a normal distribution because the sample size is way too small. It's definitely not over 30, so we need a normal distribution to make this work. All right, we have data this time. We do not have a sample mean. We do not have a sample standard deviation. We could get it, but we could do something a little easier. So let's go to our calculator, and I'll talk about that. Here's the calculator, but this is the confidence interval calculated with statistics. We don't have statistics, we have data. So let's go back to the calculator menu and let's go down and look. And we can see confidence interval for a mean with data. I click on that and that's what I need. So I need to type in the values separated by commas and I'm gonna save you the time um, I've already copied them and pasted, and there are the values of the data separated by commas. A confidence level was 0.95. And I hit calculate. And there we have it. By the way, it gives you the sample mean, which is about 21.9. The sample standard deviation was about 3.2. But most importantly, the lower bound for the confidence interval is about 20.36, and the upper bound is about 23.53 or so. So now I can go back and interpret the lower bound and the upper bound for this confidence level. Here's the interpretation. With 95% confidence, it can be concluded that the population mean age when people buy their first car is between 20.4 and 23.5 years old. There's one more thing that we need to do for confidence intervals, and that is talking about how do you decide how much data you need when we're talking about a confidence interval for a mean. So I'm going to do this by example is probably the best way. So suppose that you want to conduct a study so that you can construct a 90% confidence interval for the mean number of physical therapy visitations a patient needs after receiving ACL surgery. You want the margin of error to be no more than 0.5 visits. If you know the standard deviation of four visits, how many patients must participate in this study? So remember that the margin of error was that Z value times sigma over root N. And I could do a little algebra by multiplying by root N on both sides, dividing by E, squaring both sides. And what I get is N is equal to Z sub C, sigma over E, quantity squared. So I can plug in all these numbers into this, 
Or I can use a calculator that I built that does it for me. We just have to remember that we have our Z, our Sigma, and our E. We just have to keep track of our confidence level, the standard deviation, and the margin of error. The confidence level is 90% or 0.9. The margin of error is 0.5. Standard deviation is 4. So let's jump to the calculator. Here's the calculator again. I'm going to take a look, and I want sample size for a mean. because That's what I'm interested in. Here's the sample size calculator. Remember that the population standard deviation that we assumed to know was 4. The margin of error was 0.5. And the confidence level was 0.9. And I hit calculate in. And there it is. I get 174. So now let's interpret. If I want to conduct a study so that we have a 90% confidence interval, and we want the margin of error to be no more than 0.5 visits, and the standard deviation is known to be 4, then that means we must make sure that there are at least 174 patients participating in the study. So that is everything we need to look at for confidence intervals for this chapter. As always, if you have any questions about confidence intervals or anything else about statistics, um, just ask me or ask your instructor if you have a different instructor. We'll be happy to answer. So thank you for watching this video.